All right, welcome back. Oh. Let's pick up from where we stopped. Let's get into chapter six on your notes. Oh, video stopped. Hold on. Uh, is the video video stopped? Uh, so, uh, Nina, is the video uh, stuck for you right now? Nina, Karen, anybody can. Is the video stuck? Because here it's like. It's... Everyone can hear me okay? Sorry about that. Just stuck. Is the audio fine? Okay. Uh, so let's get into chapter six the old and the new covenant. Right. Now, while using the term old covenant, we are specifically talking about the covenant given through Moses to the people of Israel. Right? Remember the, the old covenant where uh, you know God yeah so God what does he do? He he calls Moses and he says Moses take this ten covenants and this is going to be a covenant this is what you must follow this is what you must do and then later on he gave many other uh, commandments for them to follow. So similarities, both the old covenant and the new covenant. One of the most, uh, you know, important similarity is that of the blood covenant, and we talked about it, right? The old covenant was given through Moses. The new covenant was given through Christ Jesus. John chapter one and verse seventeen. For the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? So what is the contrast here? The law was given to Moses. You follow these laws. You have to do it this way, right? These are rules and regulations that you must follow, right? If you do not follow it, there will be consequences. But here, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? The old covenant was given through Moses to the people of Israel. The new covenant is given through Jesus Christ 
to everyone who believes. So in that time, in the old covenant, there was the law, there was regulations and rules, but it was given only to the Jews, to the Israelites. Right? So you're not going to find the uh, you know people who are Gentiles and out of the covenant doing all those sacrifices and you know uh, doing all those Levitical offerings. Nothing, right? But here, grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ, and it is given to everyone. See that contrast there? Here, rules and regulations. Here, grace and truth. Here, it is for the Israelites. Here, it is for everyone, all of us, right? Hence, the old was called the law of Moses, and the new is called the law of Christ, as in Galatians 6, 2. The old is based on law. The new is based on grace. The old covenant was based on the law, which is the Ten Commandments, and then hundreds of instructions that God gave the people of Israel. And the new covenant is based on grace because of the finished work of the cross. The old covenant brought guilt, but the new covenant brought righteousness. What a wonderful, yeah, wonderful, wonderful thing that the Lord Jesus did. The old covenant, they would make those offerings, the guilt offering, sin offering, whatever offering, they would go back but they were not yet justified. It was not like you know they were uh, they had a right standing before God. No, right? The old covenant they just had remission of sins, covering of sins. But here, this free gift of righteousness is imputed. What is imputed? It is just given to us. It is poured on us. We receive it whether we like it or not. Right, so the moment I became become a believer, even if I don't know what is the meaning of righteousness in God's eyes, you are righteous. Right, only later we may realize, oh, righteousness, justification. But all that whole list happens to us the moment we become a believer. We may not understand it. Right, now for example, a, a person is coming to faith from a different religion right and they believe in jesus all they know is jesus hey i prayed uh, to many gods nothing happened but now i pray to jesus and i believe jesus is the only god and he's the only one who can wash away my sins and he's the only one who has made me a new person now this person doesn't know anything about the cross he doesn't know anything about the you know the lord's table water baptism Righteousness, justification, sanctification, redemption, nothing they know. It's a, I believe in Jesus. That's all they know. But in the spiritual realm, in God's eyes, God has already imputed. He's become a believer. He's righteous before God. He doesn't know it, but he will know it later on. You understand what I'm saying? Right? So, the Old Testament, the old brought guilt, the new brought righteousness. Right? It's a free gift. I will justify you, make you free from all guilt, shame, and condemnation. The gift of righteousness qualifies you and I to reign in life. Right? So no matter what happens, we can say, hey, I have a right standing before God. Right? The old was the letter of the law the new was the was the law or written in our hearts the circumcision of the heart a change of heart happens in new birth right uh, that is the sign of the new covenant in the old covenant it was more of the mind more of the intellect right but in the new covenant a new heart i will give you a new heart in the book of hosea he says uh, you know, Hosea 6, he says, come and return to me with all your heart uh, and, and I, will, I will wash your sins. I will do this. I will do that. I'll give you a new heart. Right? But here, the meaning of that heart is a new person, a new identity. Right? Uh, and that was not there in the Old Testament. The old was based on human effort. The new is 
based on faith empowered by the Spirit. There is human effort and there is empowering of the Spirit. I will write my words in your hearts and in your minds. I will pour out my Spirit upon you and uh, upon you who will empower you to walk in this new covenant. So the Lord Jesus is saying, and we talked about this, right? In the book of Acts, he, he tells the disciples, go and wait. Let me empower you first. Let me baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then you go and do ministry. So the Lord Jesus is saying, in the old covenant, it was only you know just human effort. But here in the new covenant, we walk by faith, but we also put in effort, right? There's also the aspect of human effort. But we are not coming, again, we're being very careful. We're not coming on this human effort to the presence of God. I love what the Apostle Paul writes. Um, you know, he says, you, the people, are my crown in heaven. Right? Now, the Apostle Paul could have said so many other things. What are my crowns? First missionary journey is one crown. Second missionary journey, one more crown. Third missionary journey is so three crowns I should have by now. Then the number of churches I started. For example, you keep it 10 churches, God. So give me 10 mini crowns for 10 churches. And then the number of leaders I raised up. And the number of books I've written. So all together, just let's close the deal on 130 crowns for me. He's not coming by any works. Paul himself is writing and saying, in many places in the scripture, he's saying, he's saying, uh, when I go to heaven, what is my glory in heaven? He's, he's asking the believers, what is my glory in heaven? You are my glory. What can I boast of in heaven? I can boast of only about you. Right? You, you see that? He's not coming by his works that he did, but he's coming by what? God did through his life to the people that he was able to bring so many people to Christ. Again, he, right, he writes it in so many places. It's not a work of, the, of human hands to become a believer. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, Who's, what is my glory in heaven? It's none of this, all of these scriptures, all of these, uh, sorry, all of these things that I did, uh, all these letters that I've written, all of that is not important what is important is you people in the presence of god that is where i will be rewarded right the old brought bondage but the new brings liberty the old was served by earthly priests but the new one has a heavenly high priest the the old served a natural tabernacle the new uses an eternal heavenly tabernacle Right, so when we look at the old, uh, uh, God instructs the people of Israel, what go, you make a tabernacle, you make it this way, wherever you go, you carry it. When you're walking uh, in, in the desert, when you camp, let the tabernacle, let it be in front, and you all camp around it. That is where I will come, I will show my presence there. Right, that is a natural, earthly tabernacle. But now, in the new covenant, you and I, can enter the heavenly tabernacle of God. We may be here in, in our body, but in the spirit, we can enter his tabernacle, enter into his presence. You get what I'm saying, right? So the, the tabernacle in the Old Testament referred to the presence of God. It was a physical place, but now you and I, being uh, you know can enter that earth that heavenly tabernacle being the presence of god imagine we can be just three of us singing songs praising god his presence is there we have entered his tabernacle three of us two of us maybe even alone we're praying we enter his tabernacle we enter into his presence and we pray Right, the old required many recurring sacrifices. So the sin offering, guilt offering, all these sacrifices—they were a recurring thing. They had to keep doing it every. There are some offerings that are done six months. There are some that are done yearly. 
uh, some are uh, done on festivals and seasons. But in the new covenant, the sacrifice was already made. When Jesus said it is finished, we don't need any more sacrifices. right? We don't need any more that the Lord Jesus has to do. You know, if, if we believe in him, we don't believe in him, he's still the king of kings. Right? So in the old covenant, it was keep doing it. The new covenant, he's done it once. He doesn't need to do it again. He doesn't have to prove to the devil, hey, I'm still victorious. And when we look around in the world, we see so much of evil that is happening. Right? The devil is, you know, just attacking, bringing so much of, you know, hatred and uh, terror in this world. He's using, you know, uh, we get these articles where children are being uh, addicted to pornography and drugs and all these things. At a young age, you see the devil is doing something. It's not like, uh, you know, God, uh, the Lord Jesus is sitting and saying, oh, what should I do now? Oh, what does it say there? A sacrifice was already made. God has already defeated the enemy. So he knows what is happening. He knows that he is still in control. Right? It's not like, oh, devil has uh, suddenly he's got too many people in his army. What should I do? No, no, no. Right? He knows exactly what to do. He's victorious. So he's not nervous about his position. Right? I was yesterday. Uh, we had our pastors, Bangalore pastors, meeting all across, and so we went for the Bangalore meeting. And we were talking about the work of God in Punjab. And you know, there was one of those one of the missionaries who had come to the meeting, and she was sharing about how God was doing such a great work in Punjab, right? And other other parts, Arunachal Pradesh as well. And it was so encouraging. You know, sometimes we look at the small things or we look at things and we say, hey, the devil is doing so much. But it doesn't mean God is not doing. He is doing his work. People are believing Jesus in scores. In our nation, there are many, 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 many Brahmins who have come to the Lord. There's a, they, she was sharing yesterday that there's a whole community of Brahmins, like thousands of people who gather together for praise and worship and uh, you know just a conference thousands of brahmins now if you look at the brahmins they are all caste system <clears throat> they all join together rich poor everyone together caste system is broken there's no caste system there why because they are a new creation in christ jesus and they look at others it's no more oh you are this you know, uh, the Brahmins have those caste systems, right? Kshatriyas and uh, Sudras and all of that. So all of that has gone away. Why? Because they understood the scriptures. So God is doing a powerful work, right? And when you look at the book of Revelations, God is going to uh, perform world revivals. Right? There's going to be revivals. It will happen. The book of uh, Revelations talks about it. Right? There's going to be world revivals. Just a fire of God spreading across the entire world. God is going to do it. Right? So don't, uh, you know, sometimes you may focus on what the enemy is doing and say, God, what happened now? We're not seeing much of you. No, no, no. He is doing his work. Right? Every day, every moment, there's, there's something that's happening. God is doing. He's not sitting idle. He's doing his work. The Holy Spirit is doing his work. Right, so whether there is anti-conversion bill, whether they they say no more Christianity, we should wipe out Christianity. It can't happen because God is building His church. God is building His kingdom, right? So always be assured of that, right? Um, even when we hear these news, hear what the enemy is doing, and we hear, you know. Uh, when you look at the evil, some of the evil that the enemy is doing, sometimes you know it just infuriates us. Gets gets so upset. You know, my child, my son, he's in, he's seven years old in second standard, but he's exposed to so much in these schools that they know about you know uh, uh, gay marriage. They know about uh, uh, LGBTQ. 
they know about uh, you know all these things that are happening about the internet you know only seven years old they think the enemy how he's not going to just look okay he's only seven let him become 12 years old then no the enemy is doing his work but god is also doing his work right uh, you and i have a responsibility right to to pray and to intercede and to look to god if we don't do it then who will do it right so we be encouraged when, when we see all of this the old has been removed the new is in force the new is an everlasting covenant it's not that the blood of jesus has an expiry date no it's not that the cross has an expiry date 10 years from now 100 years 1000 years from now the cross will have the same effect that it has on the day uh, on during the time when uh, the believers in the book of acts experienced the power of the holy spirit it's the same effect it will have there's no expiration date right uh, this is a the new is a more glorious covenant the new is a better covenant based on better promises shedding of old covenant mentality now how do i shed off this old covenant mentality luckily you and i are not doing any sacrifices and all of those things but you look at what happened in uh, after malachi those 400 years of silence what happened they were doing those offerings again and again they had no idea why they were doing it but they were doing it and Suddenly, there came a time when uh, John the Baptist is saying, "Repent! You have to be, you know, repent for the kingdom of God." For them, it was too much. No, no, no. We'll go to the temple. Why old covenant mentality? Right. What about you know, the Israelites? Right. They they came out of Egypt. No, no, no. I want that. I want what was there before. That is only better. Sometimes, you know, there's this saying. You no, know, it was. It took maybe one day for the Israelites to come out of Egypt. They just walked out of Egypt. Or it took 40 years for Egypt to come out of them. Meaning what? All those practices they did in Egypt. They said, we had cucumber meat in Egypt. They actually said it. Right? There was meat and cucumber in Egypt, but now we are eating only this. Right, so the old mentality was still there. Oh, in Egypt we had some idol. At least we go and say, you know, just touch the idol, pray, and come. Now there's no idol here. I know God is sending some manna. There's some fire that is following us in the night. There's a pillar of cloud. The sea has parted into two, and we walk through it on dry land. All that is good, but there's no idol. There's no nothing to touch. So let's make an idol old mentality right and shedding off that is very difficult very difficult now when you look at the new covenant you know when uh, i became a believer like a proper believer i used to come to church and see everyone raising their hands i will not raise my hand i'm worshiping god from my heart i don't have to pray I don't have to prove anything. I'm not raised my hand. Why? Because I never did that in my life. Right? I never did that. So it was something that uh, it was a shell that I was in. No, 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 I will not lift my hands. But I'm worshiping God from inside. They are lifting their hands, but I am, you know, inside I'm lifting my heart. All kinds of excuses. The Bible clearly says, lift up your hands, O you holy gates, be lifted up, ancient thrones. Right? It says, clap your hands together. The trees of the fields will clap your hands. Shout for joy, sing for joy, dance aloud in the presence of God. Right? I will not. That is for the old covenant, not for me. Right? Shedding off that mentality. Or, you know, sometimes we, uh, in prayer, we may say, no, this is how I will do it. I'm, this is how I will do it because I did it past 10 years. I'm doing it. This is how I will do it. No. If God ministers to us to pray in a different way, many times, you know, 
uh, I remember God would just stop me and say, stop this. I just felt the Holy Spirit, stop this. Well, what is the prayer? God, thank you for this new day. Thank you for your blessings, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hand and legs, eyes to see. Uh, thank you, Lord, for house. Thank you for bike. Thank you, Lord, washing machine and fridge. Thank you, Lord. And the thank yous are so many. <laughs> oh, 30 minutes over prayer. Only thank yous. <laughs> Forgive me if any sin is there, Lord. In the end, last five minutes, Lord. Help me not to sin, Lord. I'm your child. I receive everything that you have for me. Amen. Now, oh, 30 minutes per hour. And uh, the day would continue. But sometimes God may say, stop this. Is the prayer good? Yes. But it's just become monotonous. You're not letting me to speak. You're only saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me speak. No. And many times, many times it's happened to me. Right? Uh, now, is it good to pray for people? Yes. Uh, I'll pray for my dad, pray for my mother, my brother. And, uh, you know, everyone pray for all the pastors. Uh, bless them, Lord. Uh, if God is saying, hey, I want to talk to you. Hold on. Keep quiet. Just be in my presence. Many times, the verse came, be still and know that I am God. Just wait. So there were times, I remember, Many years ago, I would I'd just take my guitar. I'll say, sing one song and I'll say, wait. Say, God, okay, you speak. A thing will happen. Sing one more song. Then a time came, God said, you keep that guitar on the side. Did I ask you to come with the guitar? Keep the guitar. Okay, then what to do now? Nothing to do. Okay, God, speak something. So I'll say, yes, waiting, see. But many times he has spoken. Many times, just a word will come, or he'll just say, Do this. He will. I'm not saying immediately, but just waiting in his presence. It may look weird. Many times I'm waiting and I'm looking around, nothing's happening. Why? Because I'm not used to it. I'm only used to thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I never used hallelujah, but thank you. That whole list was there of thank yous. I'm not used to keeping quiet and waiting for God to speak to me. So it was very difficult to shed off that. Right? So every time I say thank you, I would feel bad. Okay, it's good to thank, but then the thank you prayer is too much. God is saying, wait, stop that. Let me speak. Let me speak. Just that one hour what you're praying, let it become meaningful. There'll be a time you pray all that thank you. But you be shed off those old habits. <clears throat> Do something new. Right? So we also, you know, if we are doing something and we see that it's becoming a, you know, a, just a, what do you call, a routine, shed it off, shed it off, right? Now, routines are good. Sometimes we feel that, oh, this is not good. I will not do it. No. Right? Uh, now, for example, we are praying and we, we don't see any vision. Don't feel that God is not hearing us, right? We have to pray. It's a, it's a thing that God has given us to do. So we press on. Sometimes we may not feel like praying. We may feel like doing something else. Right? So we've got to press on right? We, those times. But get off that old mentality. Those things that have made us to be very you know, monotonous in life. And we're not seeing fruit. Try not to follow that. Do something different. I love the Lord to minister. Right? Now, if, if you're, if you know, this this whole thing of going into the room, closing the door, and waiting, it was very weird for me. Wait for what? Wait for fire to come down. Wait for uh, angel to come and tell me. Wait for Holy Spirit, or wait for Jesus Himself to come. Wait for what? But God made me, and He taught me. You wait. You just sit. So many times in that one hour of just sitting quiet, I came out with one verse. Oh, that verse was powerful. Huh? That verse made so much meaning in my heart. And it was just, I knew, oh man, one hour, one verse. Right? But it's okay. It's better than thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. One hour, one verse. But many times he's, you know, he'll begin to just pour out. 
and speak to us. And then there are times we have to also pray. So basically what I'm trying to say is get off those old habits, those old mentalities that can suppress us, right? Rather than uplift us in the presence of God. Um, is the new covenant without law? The new covenant is called the perfect law of liberty. Let's read James 125. But he who looks, looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James 2, 12 through 13. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. So there is law, but there is mercy. And mercy will triumph over judgment. So why still read the Old Covenant? We're talking so much about the, the Old and the New Covenant. I mean, saying, hey, New Covenant is better, better than better promises, better blessings. Why still read the Old Covenant? How many of you like the Old Covenant? Online students, how many of you like the Old you like? How many of you like to read the Old Covenant? Nobody likes to read. Like to read? Yeah. All of us like to read, no? There may be some books we don't uh, prefer reading. But you like to read the Old Covenant. Oh, why to read the Old Covenant? Oh, Paul is saying, we don't go back to the law. And now we saw... Oh, the blessings that are available. Why to read the Old Covenant? Look at this. God has not changed. God is the same from the beginning. God is the same now. God has not changed. So the works he does can be different. We can learn that God himself has not changed. It's not like God of the Old Testament is this angry God and Jesus came full of grace and truth. I'll show you portions of what all Jesus has done. He has thrown the money chambers, tables, you know? yeah, many places. <laughs> In one place, he says something, you know, the, the disciples of Jesus' followers come and say, Hey, Jesus, uh, Herod and these people are coming to catch you. Jesus' reply is, Go tell that fox that I will continue to do what I'm doing today, tomorrow, and finish what I'm doing. I think Matthew 23 or something, the full list, he says, you're like this, you're like that, <laughs> hypocrite. Was that love? Yes, it is love. So Jesus walked in grace and truth, but he's the same God. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's what Jesus says, right? Because I am in the Father and the Father is in me. It's the same God. The heart and the nature of God remains the same in the across testaments. The power and glory of God remains the same across testaments. The heart and nature of God is the same. God said in the Old Testament, I'm the God who heals you. Even now, God says, I'm the God who heals you. I'm the God who will give you peace. In the New Testament, he says, I'm going to do the same thing. Right? He has not changed. His power and glory has not changed. Oh, in the Old Testament, he parted the seas. He did these wonderful miracles. But New Testament, nothing he's done. No, he's done. And he's doing. He's doing greater works. Right? We learn from God's working and dealings. We learn from God how he worked in the Old Testament. And, you know, when we read these stories from the New Testament, doesn't it encourage us? Right? It's so powerful to read uh, Daniel. What did he do? You read about Jeremiah, you read about these wonderful prophets and how God just ministered to all of them. You read about David. So wonderful, right? And, and we can learn and we can draw so much of inspiration. Every time I think of David, I'm very encouraged. Every time I think of him, the most unlikely person to become a king. But you look at Saul. Saul was looking after his father's donkeys. That was his work. God, and then God made him the king of Israel. He disobeyed God. What does God tell? Ah, Saul, there was one time you thought you were very small in your sight. You thought, oh, I am nothing. I'm just looking after donkeys. Who am I? You, know, you thought very small in your own eyes. 
now after becoming the king of Israel, you think you are so great that you disobeyed my commandment. And then to David, he says, David, I will make you the king. Right? Look at these, look at these things. Look at Nehemiah. What a wonderful God gives him the wisdom to build that entire wall. Look at Daniel in the lion's den. Shut the mouth of lions. Right? And these wonderful, wonderful stories. Elijah, Moses, Joshua. There's plenty of stories that we can learn from. There's so much that we can learn from. Right? You take these stories and use the principle in your life. Right? Uh, I think of David. Oh man, God used this shepherd boy, but he trained him so much that he killed the lion and the bears. Nobody was there clapping for David. Oh, David, you killed the lion. Probably he went home and told his brothers, hey, you know what? I was looking after the sheep. Suddenly one bear came out from outside. And then I took out my sword and I... You know, I took out my uh, sling or whatever it was. I used it and I killed a bear. And the brothers are saying, what are you saying? Huh? You're telling me? I'm in the army. I'm in the Israelite army. And you killed a bear. You're not even 10 years old. Huh? You're such a small boy. How will you? How did you do it? Probably they made fun of him. But now this training is done. The real test of time has come. Goliath is standing there. Now the Israelite army are shivering, and this young boy saying, Hey, I'll go. Right? So, you know, very important lesson. God is a God who always trains us for the things that He has ahead of us. There's always preparation time. Right? Look at Joseph, you learn so much from their lives. So you can draw inspiration from them. And you say, God, give me the wisdom, give me the strength, give me the uh, the the mindset that these people had, right? Uh, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing there. Hey, we'll throw you in the fire. You okay, King? You do what you want. You throw us in the fire. One God can save us. If He doesn't save us, still we'll not. Look at the mindset. You see the mindset there. Can we draw inspiration from it or not? Or do want Old Testament? See that? What happened? They came out unharmed. Nothing. Is it written anywhere else like this? Has it happened? Any other place where the King Nebuchadnezzar himself came and said, "Oh, nobody should speak anything about these, you know, these their God because their God is real." Right? Don't speak about them. Leave them alone. So you and I can draw inspiration from all of these stories and apply it in our lives. Right? The Old Covenant points us to Jesus Christ. There are types and shadows of the Old Testament. Uh, and we talked about that, right? From Adam to Moses and uh, all through, there are types uh, that we see. What old covenant practices still remain? Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. Anyone can read Romans 8, 8, 13, 8 to 10. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For who, for who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not quote. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. What a powerful... He, so, the Lord Jesus, in the book of Romans, Paul is saying, now, Paul knew everything about the law, yes? Right? He was studied under Gamaliel. He knew everything. Right now, he's saying all of these laws, you know, what is that? Do not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. All of these laws is summed up into one simple law, one simple practice. What is that? You shall love the Lord your God. 
and as you sorry what is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself love the lord your god love your neighbor as yourself then there's no way i'll do any harm to them if i don't want to if i love them and i don't want to do any harm to them i will not commit adultery i will not murder because i love them i will not steal i will not bear false witness nothing so there's this love the lord your god love your neighbor as yourself so paul is saying if you do all of this there is you have fulfilled the law like what does it say there verse 10 therefore love is the fulfillment of the law so we may not have to do the practices of the old testament and we don't have to do it but just by loving one another we have fulfilled the law in the old testament right so are the practices still there we don't have to go to the temple we don't have to offer sacrifices uh we don't have to do circumcision we don't have those the paul is saying you just love the lord love your neighbor as yourself and when you do that you have fulfilled the law so powerful right just one thing paul is saying love that's it's all summed up in this verse john 3:16 god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son right he gave so this should encourage us yes the the new covenant is greater with better promises better blessings but the old covenant is also important because god has not changed and god is the same we can draw inspiration and we can learn from people's lives learn from their mistakes also right one of the things that we can learn for so many things but one example is david see god made him king when abraham god told abraham right i'll give you a son i'll give you a child what happened in between he he went and you know stayed with hagar but he knew right look at david he knew he was married but he sinned but he went back to god so these are things that we can learn from right and 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 we learn from their mistakes and say god thank you for what they have done help me to walk in righteousness help me to walk with wisdom fulfill whatever you have for us amen amen so be encouraged and uh, each one of us even our online students be encouraged uh, knowing that god is with us no matter what is happening around us right let's close in prayer uh, maybe vimal can you close in prayer thank you jesus thank you lord thank you for everything you did for us lord jesus thank you for that blood covenant lord jesus thank you for everything jesus lord in this class you teach us so many things lord jesus help us to learn and gain everything lord jesus and use us for your glory every glory and every honor i belongs to you jesus in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you so much everyone uh, thank you to the online students god bless you all see you next week for next class god bless